Hello, live over here. Give us just a second to catch up on the Facebook. Oh, we love technology. And uh, just checking to make sure we're live. Are we live over on the Facebook? I don't know, Kazi. Yes, we are. There we are. Yay! Hello, and welcome to another episode of Comic Shop Talk Live. Brought to you by Black Hat Comics in Rockin' Milpitas, your one-stop shop for all things superhero. Shop online at black-cat-comics.com. We're here to keep you connected to the comic book community. I'm Mark. I'm Francie. And we're very excited today because we have our uh, first very special guest, local legend and uh, comic book artist, Mick Gray. Yay! Welcome, Welcome Mick. Mick. Hi. Do you want to very get happy to be here. Thank you. We're happy to have you. Um, for those of you on YouTube, we will post a video so you can see his lovely face after the fact. Sorry, we can't do both live at the same time. So we want to welcome legendary local artist, inker, Mick Gray. Thank so, you. So happy to be here with you guys. Mick, you have had quite, quite a career in comics. Going back to 1989, you got your start with SLG and Griffin. And then you moved over to do some Marvel work and you've been with DC for a long time. You've done your own independent stuff for a long time. You know, anyone who's been reading DC for the last 10 years, chances are you've got a book that's been inked by McRae. This is the guy. Now we can ask him questions. All your burning questions that you have. We'll have time at the very end for you to just pick his brain and figure out what it's like to work in the industry. So welcome. We're so excited to have you here. And we wanted to start off by mentioning a passing of a, of a fellow comic icon. Oh, yes, yes. We're all brokenhearted to learn about the passing of Denny O'Neill this week. Uh, I think anybody that has read uh, a comic book in their life knows Denny O'Neill, loves Denny O'Neill, is familiar with his work. If for some reason you're watching this and you're not familiar with the work of Denny O'Neill, Google his name, read everything that comes up uh, and, 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 and I will change your life. Um, We've had uh, been fortunate enough to meet Denny a couple of times at conventions and things. Uh, I, Mick, do you have personal experiences? Do you have you have yeah, stories yeah. about Denny? I like don't have any real stories of working with him, but he was a gentleman, such a gentleman, and he he knew he knew his stuff so much. You know the stories that I read about him. You know, you know, bringing on new writers and telling him this is the way I do it so follow what I tell you but then he was the type of guy that he gave you the information and then you as a writer needed it wasn't the only way to do it he would he would let people be creative and he would go with it you know but he would tell you first this is the way I would do it you know and oh man amazing man you know but uh such a yeah he had a he had a heck of a career there Oh, oh man. He touched, uh, I mean, it goes. He, yeah, he really, you know, touched characters and touched people and, uh, and got, you know, he got that uh, social commentary going in the 70s pretty heavy too for DC Comics. Yeah, for sure, for sure. That, that Green Arrow, Green say, Lantern Green stuff Arrow, is Green Lantern stuff. some of my favorite Iconic. stuff, some of a lot of people's favorite stuff. So He's true. a big part of why I talk about. And everybody has that era they grew up in and has their their creators from that time. But I've often said, I grew up in the 70s. I, I came in in the early and mid 70s to comics and it spoiled me rotten. I, I say all the time that, that if you came in when I did and, and everything you read was was written by Denny O'Neill and, and Marv Wolfman uh, and, and, and everything was, was drawn by George Perez, uh, Jim Aparo, uh, John Byrne, you know, just, I look, I've looked back from time to time at all the comics of like 1974 to 78, and, and there's not a bad one in the bunch. Yeah, uh, and, good and has, it's a great time. And Denny has a lot to do with that. He's one of the first writers that, you know, you're reading a comic and you're like, this is amazing. And you go back to that captions box and you're like, Denny O'Neill, okay. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a he real- He was something, real. he was something. And, you know, working with, with Neil Adams, man, that was a team. Mm -hmm. Insane. Um, but yeah, we've lost a lot of a lot of great ones in the last year. Yeah, it's it's been a tough year. Um, I think I think it's as it, it you know, 
I'm 60 now. As I get older, you, you just like more people die. It's just life, you know, yeah. but I mean, it's just yeah. like it's it doesn't make it any easier understanding that that's just the way it goes. As you get older, more people die around you that you've that you've known or, or admired through the years. But sure. Uh, and and you know, one thing about what we do as artists and writers is no matter what happens, we have this body of work that is there forever and people mm -hmm. and people can remember you know us for what we did and it's the most amazing thing in the world that i can you know i can pass on and i yep. still have people remembering what i did and uh gives me chills kind of to think about it you know? your work lives on yep. yeah uh, the first appearance of, of ra's al ghul will always say written by denny o'neill uh yeah, there's the character, always right? always always among obviously many many other things so god bless you denny and, and yes. thanks for your great work so this is a very odd transition but i'm gonna i'm gonna try and see and see if we land speaking of death <laughs> good one any i know any thoughts about mr dan didio oh my gosh he was very important to me you know i had yeah. to i actually had to uh, i worked with him on a couple books and there were times as an inker you know you're sitting around 30 year career you, you can't expect to usually be working constantly all the time you know yeah. inkers are a dime a dozen especially back in the in those days but um i would i would call dan hey i haven't got a call from my editor any editors lately uh should i go elsewhere should i go over to marvel i haven't been to marvel for 10 years i'd say or something like that but should i go he go no don't hold on i'm gonna and he would come through for me wow this man awesome. was there for me many times you know mm -hmm. i've you know i've heard other people horror stories about him and things that were happening you know the the hubbub that happened when he when he uh left the company and stuff um never yeah i was never involved in any of that you know as an anchor you are kind of you're Removed. kept separate yeah you're really yeah. separate from a lot of stuff a lot you know most writers, nice. most writers i've worked with i've never even met or talked to you know uh, the writer <laughs> works with the penciler a lot of the time mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i'm you know as an anchor i've i talk to my penciler sure you know but mm -hmm. i mean there's uh, no there's no doubting that didio had a love and a passion for comics no matter what you say good bad yeah. or indifferent the man Super loved his comics. Loved comics. And, and he still had does. A, a very contagious energy. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed seeing him at conventions yeah. because, like I say, very contagious. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you felt his energy. You felt his excitement about the projects he worked on. And I think that means a lot. Yeah, that's for sure, man. I, you know, he got me, uh, it's a, uh, this, this uh, project wasn't really noticed very much by a lot of people because there was a lot of other things happening at DC Comics at the time. But um, one of those phone calls that I made to him, he was like, I'm gonna hook you up with this new young guy named Marco Rudy. And I'm gonna have you, we're, we're taking on these these uh, other characters from another company. We're gonna have you guys do the shield, you know? Wow. And I didn't know anything about it and I didn't know Marco, but Marco was a, J.H. Williams fan and kind of was working in that vein, you know, working, trying to trying to look like J.H. Williams style. I was like, well, I'm the perfect guy for that. I know the style you're looking for in ink. So, yeah, right? <laughs> so I mean, we did 10 issues of that shield book and that was all because of Dan. Dan got me involved in that. and I did it. And it's beautiful. The art's beautiful in that book, you know, but it was just kind of overlooked because there was, you know, some kind of giant crossover happening at DC Comics at the same time and they didn't even promote the books, but we did 10 issues, you know. Yeah. And you brought up J.H. Williams, so we have to mention that you've won an Eisner for the Promethea Award. There, yes, it, is. there it is. Awesome. New, Congrats. One of the new editions, they just put out a 20th anniversary edition of that. So wow. that's all in hardcover, beautiful. I don't know how many Gorgeous. different editions we've had of Promethea. That's it's crazy how many they've they've made, but uh, this one's a little oversized and looks very nice. Um, but yeah, working working eight years with J.H. Williams, amazing, was a learning experience like you could never imagine. You know, he's like a director. You know, he really is. He likes to communicate with all the people. 
he works with, you know, at that time, Todd Klein lettering and mm -hmm. Jeremy Cox doing the colors and me inking. And he was working us and telling us how he wanted to see things all that time during that eight years. And there's, there's nothing as creative as this was. I mean, this was creativity to the extreme mm -hmm. and we were yep. given time to do it too, which is the worst thing about comics is we're generally <laughs> not given time to do it. This has That's to right. be done tomorrow, you know? <laughs> right, so right. I'm kind of enjoying about my time right now is that I'm not in deadline mode. For the last 30 years, it's been deadline mode every day, you know? Yeah, we were gonna ask you about that. How are things going right now? Oh, well, I'm sorry, oh, wait, wait, wait. I gotta, I gotta, wait. I don't wanna leave Promethea just oh, yeah. yet. Oh yeah. Uh, because I loved Promethea uh, <laughs> and and I, it was my favorite ABC book, um, and which says a lot because yeah, there was some a great lot of great stuff. books, uh, Tom Strong, on and on, but, but I loved Promethea. Yeah. Uh, it, particularly for the time that it was coming out. Uh, I was really loving Promethea and I was really loving Astro City. Uh, for, for a lot of the same reasons, I was reading that and, and not only was it a, were they great books, but they were, they were all time great books at a time when, when people weren't doing superheroes really well, quite <laughs> honestly. Obviously like at any time there was great stuff, but Promethea was one of the best superhero books, one of the best comics out there. Yeah. Uh, and, and I kept saying at a time when a lot of people were complaining about this or that. And I'm like, well, then you're not reading Promethea uh, yeah. because this book is everything comics should be. Well, um, yeah, but I mean, you gotta admit it is pretty deep stuff. You know, yeah. I think it's I think it's the if not the only the, one of the most spiritually uh, involved comic books ever, you know, and it's intense. And sometimes I have Alan Moore fans come up to me at a convention or something and go, you know, that's one that I haven't been able to get. And, and I'll go, well, this book, you buy it. If you're an Alan Moore fan, you buy it, you put it on your shelf, and when your mind is ready for it, it, it will be there for you. you know? There you go. Which was it, it, I always heard it was Alan's, you know, well, we kind of know it's Alan's favorite subject matter. You know, magic and the Kabbalah and all that, he, he that's his thing, you know, so that we got picked to do Alan's favorite subject matter is a pretty big honor. Which brings me to my next subset of questions. You said you don't work with the writers a lot, but I, I wondered if you had any any interaction with Alan Moore at any I point. I got to talk to him maybe twice, I think, and uh, mostly about music, you know, because he was a, he's a big music fan too, and I'm a music fanatic. So I think at one point I made him a mix uh, disc of a bunch of stuff that I was looking at, listening to at the time, and I think he knew most of it. He's he was pretty pretty hot. I tried to like stump him, give him some stuff that was pretty. Uh, esoteric or whatever he's like oh yeah that's yeah that's one i know that one yeah. you couldn't stump him <laughs> yeah i would imagine it would be tough to out esoteric alan yeah, Moore. That's true. yeah I, and I, then I just... when i went to uh england in uh 2018 i kind of was thinking gosh i i got to take this opportunity to maybe have a coffee with him or something but it was a it just didn't work out where there was like a big festival happening uh where he are around where he lives and I couldn't even I couldn't even get to that part of England at that time. So oh well, maybe some other time. I want to go back to England. That was oh, oh man, we had such a fun trip when we went in 2018. I I got to go do it again. That was our only time ever out of the country, really. So remember going places and doing things. Wasn't going that places and doing things were fun. Getting man, I mean, the other day I just like got up at six o'clock in the morning and just drove over to the beach and just walked on the beach for a you know half hour or an hour just because it just felt so good yeah. and you know there's nobody around at that time it was beautiful what beach do you go to i went to rio del mar which is just just a little tad south of uh what is it uh, uh it's right I can't remember the, the the beach. It's just right. It's a really tiny little area, but it's great because they have parking right on the beach there too. Nice, nice. So fun, yeah, we're, but just so nice. Anywhere over there, that's where I want to be. I mean, we're looking at we're looking to move out of San Jose actually right now, and we're looking down at you know maybe we'd be we can't we'll never be able to afford living on the coast, but we can be about 10, 15 minutes away nice nice Which is pretty cool so that that's where i cool. want to be for the rest of my life is 10 or 15 minutes from <laughs> the beach there you go that's a great aspirational goal <sighs> i love that 
the the air the yeah. air is therapeutic mm -hmm. it is yeah go over there and breathe it it's just like yeah. oh. that's right yeah so we were talking about your hiatus. So oh yeah, the last yeah, couple yeah. of months. Yeah, what you what you've what's been doing been to uh, fill the time? Well, not working constantly. Yeah, my big projects right now. Oh, <gasps> uh, yeah, I'll, I might even I might even show you a little bit of it. <gasps> uh oh, but uh, the one that's the one we just finished is a, I, I'll, I guess about a year ago when I saw, DC comic jobs kind of not being as regular you know i was just doing littler stuff yeah i started thinking to myself and i started putting out into the universe i'm one of those type of people i want to do more indie stuff and more european style stuff because i love those Ooh. but i never got to do those ever in my career because yeah. of dc comics yeah so i put that out there and immediately i get emails and the first yeah, email works. i think was from an editor at heavy metal magazine yes and, i love heavy metal and she says would you like to work um on peter townsend's life house this is a rock opera that he never got to be able to make and we're going to do it in a 150 page graphic novel hardbound graphic novel oh. and my jaw hits the table and I almost say, I'll do it for nothing, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't ever say that. I'm glad I didn't. But, but so we are 75 pages in on this. It's a 150 page graphic novel, 12 by 12. It maybe might have vinyl in the back of maybe the demos. The demo, Ooh. the music that was going to be in Lifehouse was pretty much ends up being Who's Next. So Bobo O'Reilly going mobile, all those songs. There's a, there's some of the whose best songs would have yeah. been the soundtrack to this rock opera. But mm -hmm. everybody thought Townsend was crazy. This is after uh, uh, Tommy at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they blew it off. It was never made. So he always kept it in the back of his mind and he wanted to do this. And he got together with uh, this writer, James Harvey, who is just unbelievable, really great. And he took all of Pete's concepts, because this was conceptualized over many years, manipulated even into a BBC radio play at one point they did it, um, which wasn't correct. It was kind of messed with at that point. But then what James Harvey did was he took all of these scripts and said, sat down with Pete and said, let's make this the ultimate version. Let's make this the definitive version of Lifehouse. Oh my God. And so the script is amazing. I mean, I, I don't read a lot of scripts being an anchor because I don't have time or I don't need to. I might have to reference it. In this case, I was so, you know, I'm such, I've been a, a Who fan since I was 16 years old. So, yeah, yeah. So I sat down and I just, I think I've read it three times already. It's so well written. It's really beautiful. And uh, so we started in on it. And then at some point, uh, Pete decides he's going to take it to another publisher. So we're 75 pages in, I, I am stopped. We are, we're not working on it at the moment. We're waiting for new contracts with a new publisher. Uh -huh. It's killing me, but I mean, there's, there's no way it's not gonna happen. You know, this, yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Yeah. this is a product that he's totally behind. Uh, yeah. we, we were supposed to do a panel at San Diego Comic-Con about it and stuff like that. And of course, everything has changed there. So, yeah. um, the book will get done. I have no even question about that, but when will I get back on the last 75 pages? Well, and I'm what hoping if, that by the end of the month is what I'm hoping because <laughs> I've been waiting for three or four months now. And what a perfect like merge of all the things that you love, right? Have oh, you done something like that where it's music and comics combined? This is it. This is my dream project, right? you guys. You, wow. If you know anything about Mick Gray, he's a music fanatic. Music. And if he wasn't in comics, he would have to be working in doing something. I don't know what, but I'd have to be working in the music. music. I'd, be, I'd be a record store guy behind the <laughs> counter at the record store, I guess. But the idea, like the idea of getting vinyl in my comic book uh, similarly, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge music guy. I love vinyl records. 
and uh, and and the so, idea of having like a seven inch tucked yeah. inside my comic that I could play while I read the book. Exactly. Just the, the coolest thing I could think of. My my dream is, and I hope Pete's dream too. I still haven't been able to talk to Pete because he's uh -huh. busy, but I'm, hopefully one day I get to meet him. Um, the dream is our 150 page graphic novel is the thing that makes the Hollywood movie happen. Yeah. Oh, yep. nice. Yeah. Because this thing, as I work on it and I read it and I listen to the music, I see, you know, like a Pete Townsend version of Andrew Lloyd Webber's Evita or whatever. You know, this is this wow. is epic. This thing is Opus. epic. And maybe it, the the subject matter didn't really fit in in 1972 or whatever. But now it it works. You know, it's relevant. Uh -huh. The government has taken over, they've taken music away from everybody, they're controlling everybody through a internet. Pete Townsend kind of talked about the internet in 1972 in his story, so you can kind of say he was prophetic there, but. Wow, fascinating. Well, it's, I can't wait to see it. I hope it comes out this year. Yeah, oh, Early next year. We're, you know, like I say, if we get it, uh, back on it by the end of the month, we're gonna be jamming at that point. Um, at one point, uh, the first, 30 or 40 pages are drawn by um, James Harvey, the writer. And at that point, I'm not sure exactly why or how it happened, but he dropped out and they, the, my editor goes, we're gonna find another penciler that looks just like him. And I was like, how can you do that? You're not gonna <laughs> find another penciler that looks like him. But yeah, that never found, works. They found this guy by the name of Max Prentice. And now I am just totally blown away. This guy picked up the style. You will never notice the change, which is very important to me. And I hope I add to that a little bit, seeing that I'm inking both of them. You know, I'm inking the 40 pages by James and the rest of the book by Max Prentice. So I can kind of make the, 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 the look consistent. But yeah, 12 by 12 hardbound, 150 pages. And like I say, if you, if you look around, you can, you can hear some of the uh lifehouse demos too townsend put out like a six cd set of demos that were written specifically for it and there's some really great music even stuff you know that um that wasn't on most of the stuff like i say is on who's next but then there's other stuff that ended up on pete townsend records and stuff like that so it's going to be something if they whether they put cds in the back or where they put vinyl it's going to be i can't wait awesome sauce so yeah so that there's my european project kind of and then i got connected with a guy by the name of michael finn who's just kick-started a project called liberty brigade and he's got a company yes. called thrilling adventures comics and liberty brigade is all these um uh public domain superheroes from the 30s 40s and 50s oh, and cool and Michael Finn knows everybody in the business. So this is a superstar who's who of comics. And this one's a hundred and hundred, uh, maybe more than a hundred pages, hardcover, volume one, there's gonna be more, um, but the majority of it or a good chunk of it is me and Barry Kitson. And so, uh, yeah. And so Barry I've known Kitson. Barry, you know, since back in the day when we were doing Legion of Superheroes together. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't really, you know, stayed in touch with them other than a little Facebook here and there. So now I'm back with my buddy, Barry Kitson, who is one of my favorite guys to ink. And I inked about a good 60 pages, I think, of, of Barry in this Liberty Brigade that'll be coming out. And that's up on the Kickstart. They're re doing reorders right now. It hasn't come out yet, but that'll be out, be coming out by the end of the year too, I would imagine, you know, so awesome. that's um, beautiful. And I have some stuff I could show you some of that too. Well, yeah, yeah, Why yeah. do I think Mark Wade has something to do with that? Yes, Mark Wade, because Mark Wade, it was our, we've known Barry and Mark, Mark have known each other forever and ever, and he was the writer on the Legion of Superheroes stuff, and Mark is editing this all. Um, um, Michael Finn wrote it, and so he's working with a great writer that can help him and, and edit at the same time, so it's, it's pretty high end. There's all sorts of... Uh, little uh secret origin pages 
done by different people. There's little stories, George Perez, you know, I mean, just like there's everybody in this, in this thing. It's wow. crazy. So I, I was so blown away that I got these two projects and uh, we've fin like I say, I finished my part. He's just putting together, uh, get, the, the colorist on a lot of it is Chris Sotomayor and he's doing an amazing job at that. Mm -hmm. um, and so a little indie project, uh, actually a gigantic indie project and this gigantic European slash rock and roll project. I, 60 years old, not working for DC. Oh, well, I'm happy. There you go. I mean, how awesome is that though? Like your first cast out of the net and, and you get Pete Townsend, come on. I don't That's know how, so cool. I don't know how that happened. And the neatest thing you're a about- legend. That's how. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, you got to, once you get a name in the business, I think that helps a little bit, mm -hmm. but sure, we have an editor that I'm so blessed to have. She was with uh, Heavy Metal, and then when this all happened, she decided to go freelance and move with us to this new project. So right. at least I have a connection. I wouldn't have known what was going on, so I can at least email email my my editor once every few weeks and go so where are we are we getting close yes mm -hmm. you're getting closer and uh we're getting contracts soon so be ready so yeah i get yeah, i mean like i say i'm not worried about it be, even though it's been three four months since we've worked on it but i mean it, it, it we know what's going on in the world and you can at least say that townsend's got more time to uh deal with this right now he ain't touring you know so yeah. he's got time to deal with it you know so it's true that's true so i'm sure we'll get a great new publisher but uh we'll see where it goes fingers crossed um while we're talking about things you're working on and uh, the music comics combo uh why don't you tell us a little bit about deep, deep cut. cut deep cut oh yeah deep cut well podcast. about two years ago almost three years ago i started making uh interview podcasts with artists that i've met over the years being a comic book artist and a music fan is it's a great way to meet musicians because i'll go to a show or at least i used to go to shows and i'd bring a book and i'd go hey here's a book you like comic books oh all musicians love comic books and so we talk kind of true, I get huh? to meet them. <laughs> it's a really great connection it's a really great connection mm -hmm. art versus art art meets art Yep. And uh, so I met a lot of musicians. So now I have this great list of people that I can call up and interview and make really nice. There, there's about 10 of them up on YouTube right now. YouTube's not the best home. I got to find a better podcast home. But um, what I do is I, I interview them kind of talking a lot of the time about their an overview of their career. And in between, as we talk about songs and albums, I intersperse clips of songs throughout. That's what YouTube doesn't like is when I'm using songs. Oh, the copyright like. thing. But yeah. I'm doing it with the artists. So sometimes they break, they take me down, but I just put it back up again and they don't bother me for a while again. So, so uh, I've interviewed everybody so far uh, from uh, Willie Nelson's son, Micah Nelson, who's a oh, yeah. great musician on his own uh -huh. to, uh, Boots Riley from Oakland, a really great rapper and is, uh, now a director and uh, doing has won some awards for movies he's made. Um, right. And who else? My favorite guitarist, uh, the Z League of Rock and Roll, Mr. Chris Spedding. And he's is one of my uh, um, interviews. And I just got done with uh, a guy by the name of John Langford. He, he's uh, one of the uh, he's the original originator of the band the Mekons, who are one of the first mm -hmm. punk bands from England about 1976. And now he just does three million different bands. Now he's just all over. <laughs> he lives in Chicago now, and so wow. such a really a really interesting guy and one of my favorite people in the world. Cool. So I just sat down and interviewed him, and this is the first one in that I've done in two years. The first the ten that are up were done two years ago. And I just got everything got in the way and I wasn't able to do anymore. But now I'm starting to gear up because think about it. What's a better time to interview musicians than right now? Yeah, they're sitting they're around. The they can't tour, you know? <laughs> so, Smart. yeah, I'm going to be doing probably a lot of them in the next couple of weeks if I can. And then my I have a great producer that takes what I do is I record it. I send them over the file. 
and then I listen to first I listen to the file and I go okay I want to I want a song at two minutes 30 seconds I want a song at four minutes five seconds and then and give me two minutes of the song in between I just tell him what I want and he puts it all together boom wow. super really really good that's great so I'm really happy to be and pleased to be working with a guy that that knows what he's doing there because I, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to do it people <laughs> so that's so you, the deep cut podcast and it's uh it's just a gas because uh i just love talking about music with artists and that's my thing and what's the handle how can people find it um if you just go to youtube and go and put in the deep cut the deep cut podcast it'll bring up my page there the deep cut podcast okay great yeah. will do yeah that sounds awesome i like to say i'm i'm Big fan of music, and I, it doesn't didn't really occur to me, but it's true that 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 comic people uh, do tend to be big music fans. Oh, I, I it's, wonder it's, what it the, crosses uh, crosses over so much, man. And musicians, you know, they they all almost all the musicians I ever run into grew up on comics. Yeah, you know? we ran into uh, King Buzzo from the Melvins uh, at hey, Comic Con. Comic book fan. Uh, he's a huge comic book fan. And he was crossing the street, you know, just, you know, with somebody. And she and I just just freaked out, right? Uh, to ourselves, not like- it's hard you know, to miss I, him, right? It's hard uh, to miss him. <laughs> uh, hard to miss him. And we love the Melvins. Love. And and so we were like, oh my God, you're that guy. And he was genuinely surprised that, that anybody recognized him. And I was like, what? what are you talking about? Everybody here knows who you are, dude. Seattle legend. Um, so- Yeah, his- uh, he works with uh, Secret Serpent uh, uh, posters. Um, and my friend Justin McNeil and the posters that they make for specifically for the Melvins. If you've seen any of the posters, yep. it's some of the yep. best graphic artists in the industry, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's but, great. Stuff. But but uh, the Mekons, uh, I don't know if you know that term, but uh -huh. that comes from Dan Dare, the British comic book, and the Mekon was this large-headed alien you know so that's where those guys oh, got the name for their see? they got their name for a, from a comic book yeah tying it yeah. all together that. <laughs> it all it all wraps around that's that's awesome we've got someone who already wants to pre-order that pete townsend book so the orders oh, are already, I wish coming, in. Orders are already order, coming in we're your exclusive <laughs> distributor that's right if, <laughs> just you know just you know become friends facebook friends with me and you know, you'll know immediately okay. when it's available you know there you go. Yeah, that's, that sounds awesome. Uh, and it just, I don't know why this pops into my head, but get back to the, the insert in the, uh, the he, Pete Townsend thing. He can't thing. get over that. Uh, like, well, it reminded me uh, that the Max did something like that. Um, Sam Keith did something where you bought a CD to play while you read the Max. Yeah. Uh, does that ring a bell? I don't, I don't remember. I don't own it's, the CD, but I remember yeah. him doing that. And I it's remember thinking done. that was really cool. Yeah, that's a, for people that are hip, that does happen uh, um, kind of often. And uh, it, it's a, it's just the coolest thing to have a soundtrack for your reading. Oh yeah. You know? Nothing. Yeah. Better. Well, I just, I remember uh, that coming out and thinking, I thought that very thing, I was like, what a great idea, you know? more people should do this and, yeah. and anyway that's it's a great fusion music and, and comics and, and yeah well I, I i sure hope that there's a reason why this uh why the life house is 12 inches by 12 inch uh, book hardbound book. yeah it makes that's, sense that's a, doesn't a nice uh nice piece of vinyl could fit nicely in the back of that <laughs> wow we're talking one of the one of the things i have here i don't quite know how to put this so if you could do one of those, what am I trying to say? Do you have that creator owned book in your head? If Image called you and said, we want a Mick Gray book. Uh, if somebody called you and said, you know, here's a title. Anything uh, you want to do, yeah. Do, right. Does Mick Gray have that creator owned? And of course you don't have to give it away live on yeah. the internet. But but do you have a thing that you would do like in an image comics capacity or something like that? Do you yeah, have I've never that really owned? thought about it? It's it's you know, me, I've always thought of myself as just this specialist, you know. I know how to do I know how to use these tools and I know how to apply this ink to paper and I know how to get different textures and tones and things like that. And I've always just thought of myself as a specialist. So I've never thought about doing my own 
project other than, you know, in 2009, when I started working at the Academy of Art, I got enough uh, inspiration to do my own children's book, Albie Mouse. Right. Um, but after I did that, it was such a, uh, that was such a terrible time to do it. I couldn't even find a publisher. So I had to publish it myself and I'm happy I did it, but would I ever do it again? Very I cool. do not know. I do not know. And, and I know I don't, to answer your question, I, I really don't have any concepts that I think about because I love working with other guys that do, you know, that, that blows me away so much. I guess I'm, I guess I'm just a lifelong inker. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that, sir. There's nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, that's kind of a segue to my next thing, because being a, first of all, everybody knows much like music, uh, though music doesn't have to be this, comics is hugely collaborative. Uh, there's, you know, uh, writer artist, right? Writer penciler. Uh, generally speaking, there's always at least three people working on your comic. Yeah. Uh, well, I see. So anyway, it's a collaborative thing. Um, so you're someone with a with a lengthy career with some of the the coolest, biggest names in comics. Uh, what makes a good collaboration? Uh, for you, like, what do you, what, what makes the relationship work for you? And who's one of your favorite people to, uh, to work with? Oh, man, I have so, yeah, I worked with, you know, Ryan Suk, Barry Kitson, J.H. Williams, Pat Gleason, you know, mm -hmm. Carrie Nord, uh, you know, uh, uh, Lee Bermejo, you know, there's been so many great guys. I think I have the, I think I have the best lineup of fantastic artists I could think of and the king don't forget the king yeah i've even roundabout worked with jack kirby and 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 inked steve didco and you know i mean Dude. it's it, it's insane the um i just inked on on liberty brigade i inked a page of Ram ramona fratton oh 90, 93 <laughs> years like old and favorite. still going just rocking it you know god love her that's awesome so those kind of they're, they're these amazing honors, you know, to, to work with any of these guys. But the thing that makes it all work the best is when I'm always uh, concerned when I, when I work with a new penciler and I'm always like tentative and I'm like, gosh, I sure hope this fits. I hope I'm the right guy. And then when I get that phone call and they go, that's exactly what I'm looking for. That's it. And I, then you go, oh, and you're like creativity and and uh, confidence goes through the roof. Then the lines get even better because I'm not worried anymore. I know that I'm doing the right what they want to see, you know. So that is the best moment when when the artist goes, you know, this is what I'm looking for. And my whole in my mind, being an anchor is getting in inside their mind a little bit and may and these days with the internet it's really not getting inside their mind it's just going to look at their body of work on the internet and going yeah. this is where they look the best in the old days we couldn't do that we had to run down to your guys store and start pillaging through your comic books to look at them. Right. right but now i can go oh ryan sook i wonder what he what how he looks good and i can just look through all of his work on the internet and go okay this is the way he looks the best you know and mm -hmm. and then it, it, it it's just me trying to be a chameleon a little bit and trying to be what what do they want to look like it's not to me it's not what i want them to look like it's what they want to look like you know because they started this this piece of art and i'm just making it maybe a little bit more presentable and ready to be printed you know or ready for the colorist the other thing i got to think about a lot too is i got to i i want to think about the colorist so they they can understand oh okay i see a light source there i see where the light's coming from and then that colorist can nail that too you don't want the colorist being com confused about it you know and so, I, would, I mean my that's my job is to make make you know the, the work look presentable for him so he knows what he's going to do and make that penciler happy i would think that's got to be so hard to kind of adapt to different artist styles book that's the book that is book. i think the most fun part of my job is the talent is, you the know talent. yeah lee bermejo is this angular you know crazy lunatic artist you know yeah. lunatic painter man that 
that paints this the craziest stuff but then when he pencils at least back when i was working with him it's hyper angular you know it's super all sorts of little angles and to capture that was really fun although very very tedious and very uh time consuming but then there's another guy like uh you know maybe uh uh, Carrie Nord on uh, on Wonder Woman mm -hmm. that is much more loose and I'm not loose I mean I'm not a loose artist you know so when I got to work with Carrie he kind of opened me up a little bit even though that was a weird project working with Carrie on those six issues because he started the first three issues were hand penciled and then he said Oh, I'm transitioning right now to digital pencils. I was like, "What?" In the middle of our right now, he means the middle right of now. our project, you're going to trans, you're going to use me as your guinea pig to see if I can ink your. So he was, you know, I was learning so much and watching how he was developing digitally. It was a very strange experience, but there's another one. I learned a little bit more, and uh, it worked out pretty good. It turned out good, but I had to. I really had to be a little looser on that stuff because it was, at least it was loose in a bold fashion. You know, it's not like, like if I had to ink, let's say, uh, um, Frank Miller, I don't think that would work. I wouldn't be able to ink Frank Miller, really. That's a different feel, a different style, um, you know, just you know, probably not right for me. There's, there's certain guys I'm not right for, but that one was a great one. I was able to go in a direction that he wanted to go mm -hmm. so it's it is that's really fun but uh like i say there's certain guys that, that i that i've turned down you know people come to me and a lot most editors that are smart they're not even going to offer me certain stuff that's just like mm -hmm. that's not what he does you know so. i don't know i i i was you describe Romeo and nord that's two very different art styles that they you're are. able to, to tackle very pretty fair. well as as you were describing that, I, I thought, well, that's quite a range, yeah. you know. If if you can if you can work with those two and somewhere in the middle, I, I don't I don't know I don't know yeah. what you I love. Do. I hope that I can go down in history as an anchor that that nobody can tell I'm working on that book. I want I always want people to go. That's Carrie Nord or that's Lieber Mayho. You know, that's the biggest honor and compliment to me that I'm not showing through. It's them showing through and I'm making that happen, you know. So, you know, I love a Terry Austin. Terry Austin is an amazing anchor. Don't but, we all. He, but Terry Austin put Terry Austin on it. You know, he when you look at work, you can go, that that's Terry Austin, you know. So yeah. That's what he I, did. I bug her. I irritate her all the time talking about the difference between a John Byrne inked John Byrne and a Terry Austin inked John Byrne. Yeah, yeah that's I, the eye rolling sigh. I'm yeah, very personally, with. personally, I like everything by John Byrne inked by other people. I <laughs> Yes, and I love Byrne. I love, I love Byrne. Byrne too, but uh, I just don't like him inking himself. But I think we're, yeah, I think most of his fans strangely are in that camp. Yep. Of, uh, and that's part of where the conversation begins with where I bore her to death is I was like, yeah, and, and you know, I love Byrne, but I don't yeah. like it when he inks his own stuff. I always, I, I always love Carl Kiesel over him too, man. Carl oh, Kiesel, oh, just, yeah. that was some of my favorites. Another stuff. great inker. So I'm looking at some questions we've got for you and we've okay. got a huge Jack Kirby fan. So if there's anything more you can noodle out from that experience to share, my, that would be great. My, my favorite Jack Kirby story um are the first time I ever got to meet him down in San Diego and I'm there with Dan Vado um, on the floor before it's open you know you get you, when yeah. you go in with the retailers you can go in and set up right so I'd be in there with slave labor graphics and that's about 1990 and I come walking down an aisle and there's Jack Kirby sitting at a table just you know one at his in his booth by himself and I'm like no, I'm nobody. I haven't even started working in comics pretty much. I mean, I've done a, a couple little things with Dan at that point. And I walk up to him and I go, Mr. Kirby, my name's Mick Gray. And we start, I shake his hand and he starts telling me stories of, you know, we start talking about, you know, drawing. And he goes, Yeah, I used to draw on my table at school and get in trouble for it. And, you know, it, 
and I was telling them stories about, oh yeah, I used to draw on my table at school and the, I, you know, I was the only one in class that they'd let leave the, the drawing on the table. <laughs> they wouldn't make me clean it off, you know? That's awesome. And, and uh, so meeting Jack Kirby in a casual situation like that when we had no connection whatsoever, I didn't say, yeah, I'm breaking into comics. I didn't say anything like that because I was barely even in comics at the point. But he was the most wonderful person. And I think this is something that everybody will ever say about Jack Kirby is he was the most wonderful, welcoming guy ever. You know, I know many people that are art collectors that went to Jack and Roz's house and had sandwiches with them. She would make sandwiches for you if you came over and you'd be looking through artwork and stuff and crazy. That's something that I never got to do, but my good friend Len got to go to his house and hang out at his house and stuff. Len and Marv, we, we've heard them share that story a lot about and hanging out Scott with them. Scott Shaw. Yeah. Yeah, it's, pretty, it's a pretty phenomenal thing. And then my, the, the, the strangest story is my inking of Jack on a splash page for Phantom Force. I was working with Jack's assistant uh, Michael Thibodeau. This is one of the first books I ever got to ink. And uh, Michael sends me a, a splash page. He goes, oh, I'm sending you this splash page to ink. It's, oh, by the way, it's Jack's pencils. And uh, you, and I'm like, what? You want me to ink Jack Kirby? <laughs> <laughs> and so this thing sits in my studio for like six months. I can't get up enough nerve to do it. You know, I'm, I'm doing all the other art that Michael sends me on the book, but I'm not inking the splash page at all because I can't. So how old were you and how early in your career was that? That's 1990, uh, it was about 1990 or 1992, something like that, you know? So, so, like so I'm just in. starting. I haven't even got my yeah. chops at that point, seriously. Yeah. You know, I, I don't even know what I'm doing. But well, well, I just I just start looking at, you know, Mike Mar Mike Royer and, and Joe Sennett and the guys that did ink him and that knew him. And, and I start looking at that and I decide that I think I'm ready to do it. and. You know, Jack's still alive at this point. That's what I was going to say. I was like, but Jack's still alive then. You're still feeling the pressure. Like, <laughs> and he's, if he's in heaven, he can't call you and yell at yeah, you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and to top it off, it's like, if it, anybody today knows we don't ink Jack Kirby pencils, right? Nobody, no, if you find Jack Kirby pencils, nobody inks them anymore. You make a blue line copy of it and you ink right. it, right? Or whatever. It stays pristine. It's like Bible, you know? Mm -hmm. And, but I didn't, I'm, this is 1990. I didn't know. So I just ink on, I ink the pencils. I ink Jack Kirby's pencils right on the board. <laughs> I have, I have a Xerox of the pencils. I actually still own the page. I, I still have the page. But then that, that's, I finish it and it's San Diego time and I'm on the floor full, you know, walking shoulder to shoulder in San Diego and I, Come up to Jack Kirby. I passed Jack Kirby. Jack McGray. I'm the guy that inked that splash page for Michael for Phantom Force. Oh man, that turned out great, man. Looks looks just like Joe said it. And I just get I get chills. Oh. I get chills to this day saying that I, you know, this is in front of, you know, all sorts of people. You know, there's yeah. people that know this is Jack Kirby that's talking to me, you know. And I'm like, and we just pass. You're like you're like ships in the night on the floor of San Diego, you know? Yeah. yeah. Wow. He dies, he dies within I guess a year of that. You know, I never got to see him again. Those are my only two meetings with Jack Kirby. But then flash forward way, you know, to what about three years ago or something like that. And I'm showing that page off on Facebook. And a lot of uh, Jack Kirby uh, aficionados start seeing it and they're going. Mm, I'm not so sure that's Jack Kirby's pencils. They start saying things like this. Oh. And I'm like, oh man, I went through, you mean I went through 25 years now <laughs> saying this is Jack Kirby's pencils? And so what it came down to is at the end of Jack's life, he had a stable, he had a he had a a, a stable of artists that worked for him. We'll never know the full story. Even asking Michael Thibodeau at the time, who was, you know, got the art from Jack. Here's here's the page. Um, there was a stable that would touch things up, that would change things, maybe even uh, lay out a page for him or something. Now, all I can say is Jack Kirby touched that page. 
That's yes. right. That's right. It's a curvy page. Any way you look at it. Whether I ever find out that it was it was all him, it was very shaky. The the art on it was very shaky. Sure, but this sure. is at the end of his life. He was having a tough yeah. time. Yeah. I know he saw it and he liked it. We, I, you know, I talked to him. You know, so so not only not only did you get a compliment from Jack Kirby, which is. The, the, best. the highest honor we have in this business that's the medal of honor of comics uh but so but true. you got but as an anchor you got one of the next best things which was compared to joe sinnott um my uh, hero uh, i would imagine so like yeah. a lot of people if 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 you if you're if you're uh, knowledgeable of a, of a wide range of comic art and comic artists. Joe Sennett is a name that comes up all the time. You're very familiar yeah. with him. Um, so true. So, like I say, to get a compliment, uh, not only from Jack Kirby, but to be uh, compared to the great Joe Sennett is, is I mean, man, that, that yep. I might have passed out if somebody said something like that to me. Yeah, I mean, awesome. you know. My little touches to Jack Kirby are still to this day my biggest honors. The one other one is a book uh, that was put out. It's called the the Black Book, and what it was was they took Jack Kirby's sketchbook. He he sketched every character he, pretty much he had ever worked on in a sketchbook for for his wife Roz, and this book. Um, they decided one day to take it get 125 different inkers, each to ink one page out of it. Mm. And I got I got selected to ink a nihilist from Fantastic Four in there. Cool. And that I still own that art too. You know, these are pieces of art that are so important to me. I, I could never sell them, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh it was just very cool if you look at that. I mean it's kind of an obscure book now. It's just a it's a it's a you know a, a pinup book of all these different characters of Jack's career. Um, but I mean, oh my God, I got to be involved with these 125 different, really amazing inkers. And just talk about styles. There's, there's a hundred, there's a hundred different styles in the book. You know? That's awesome. That's amazing. So we've got a couple other folks that are huge, huge DC fans uh, oh, watching yeah. right now. Do you have any, you know, insider news? What's going on with DC? Have you been to the DC Burbank offices? Have you any any nuggets you can share about? Yeah, DC? I have been to the DC offices once about uh, two years ago, I think, when they first moved in. Really nice digs, man. They, I mean, I I went to the New York offices too back in the day, mm -hmm. and that was cool. But uh, this one, this is, you know, a really nice office. Do they bring the vault? Is the vault in Burbank? Yes, the vault's there. And you know, when I went down, they didn't bring me in the vault, but I know friends of mine that have went into the vault. Yeah. They wouldn't let you in the vault? Come on, you're yeah. great. I mean, I have, I, well, we, I guess maybe if I would have asked, but I didn't ask. But I have, I see pictures of my friends, you know, other, other professionals holding, you know, action number one, you know, in the vault. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what? Where's my turn? So, one of That's these days, guys, DC visit. guys listening, I'll be back, mm -hmm. man. My mm -hmm. next trip to Disneyland, I'll be stopping into the office, man. <laughs> I think you need to make that happen. So any any news? So I know and, and you know me so being an anchor and being unconnected uh, pretty much all the time. But in general, lately, because I've only done like I was telling you guys earlier, my last two uh, uh, small projects with DC are this one just coming out, which is Catwoman Anniversary Edition. I Came out last week. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, which I did 10 issues over Emma and then, uh, or 10, 10 pages, excuse me. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, Mark Buckingham in an issue of Justice League Dark that I inked 10 pages too. Both really fun projects, but that's all I've done. 20 pages in the last mm -hmm. year, probably with DC, all this other stuff is. So, you know, is it that you get to be an old dude and they don't care about, oh, he's an old dude anymore. We want the young, Young no. whippersnapper inkers. I don't no. Know. I, don't know. Well, I, do I, still, I do still have really great editorial connections with the company. I was going to ask. And they, yeah. they email me on a regular basis and they, they ask me if I'm available. And I've been turning down projects lately because I don't know when I'm going to get back on the, the Lifehouse. So, mm -hmm. you know, what 
Murphy's Law says if you take on a 20 page book or multi issue project, the Lifehouse stuff falls in tomorrow, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I'm financially okay where I can just say, guys, this is what I'm working on. You do understand that this is the biggest, coolest project I've ever worked on. I don't want anything in the way. Thank you for calling me. I feel I feel honored and a little bit assured that you're not forgetting about me because you keep calling me. So, so as long yeah. as editors call you, it's all you want. That's true. Even if you're turning them down. A lot of editors appreciate somebody that turns them down because they know that you're not taking too much on and then going to give them a hard time when the deadline hits. Oh, sorry. I was working on my other project because I couldn't right, get yours done. Right. So, so I think, I always think being straightforward and uh, truthful with editors is very, very important. They will come back to you if you do that. Honest and straightforward. That's an interesting professional model. Um, so <laughs> That's such a good thing. Truth. Truth. So Justice, wants, the Justice, American Justice, way. the American way. <laughs> That's right. We're big fans of that. If anybody wants to post some questions, we can get to them in a few moments. Are you reading anything current? Are you uh, are you caught up on on anything? Is there a book right now that you're nuts about? I am not reading anything. I'm so I feel so stupid that I can that I say that, but I know my one of the coolest books I've bought lately is uh, Andrew Ferragro. Uh, create a curator of the cartoon art museum put out a history a definitive history of batman that's about oh. it, it's it's gigantic it's a coffee table book this thick and it's one oh of the God. coolest definitive books ever so i will plug that one for him because he's an amazing guy one of my favorite people in the world and he did a dang good job on this thing man who's the publisher do you know it's got to be decent. yeah it's one of those big like it's got to be a big one yeah because yeah. it's a really fancy coffee table book. Multiple situations in the book where you come onto a page and it has like an exact replica of the script from, you know, Batman, first Batman movie. Or you come onto a page and it has a, a cutout uh, of a Batman mask. Or, you know, it's just got all sorts of inserts throughout the book. It's really a neat book. Awesome. And it's got one piece of art that I worked on with Patrick Gleason in it too. So. Oh, right on. Oh, I feel honored to be included. <laughs> Sounds like a great book. <laughs> Folks at home, as we're uh, wrapping it up, we'd like to keep it within an hour, but uh, if anybody's got questions for our special guest, Mick Gray, feel free to throw them out there now. Are you still teaching at the Academy of Art in San Francisco? Well, when this happened, when all this happened, I. Um, uh, we were three or four weeks into the semester and we had to go on what we're doing here. This is the way yeah. I was teaching. Yeah. Um, and it was a learning process for everybody and, and the students, you know, they're doing their best, but they, you could tell they're, you know, they, this isn't what we signed up for. We had, we signed up for having me over your shoulder watching you use the brush and oh leave move your hand a little bit different way hold that a little different way i can't do that you know mm -hmm. and so we manipulated the course to to work and we got through it i think they were semi happy with it but uh where that goes from here no uh no classes for the summer at the academy of art but uh we will see if i'm teaching in the fall really what, don't courses, know. what courses were you teaching there um yeah i only teach what i know and that's comic book inking so i had a comic book i had a comic book inking uh kind of a a, a beginner class and then a uh advanced class pretty much the same thing because they're using tools most people i'm teaching are uh computer digital guys and mm -hmm. so to understand the, the tool what a brush makes or what the lines that a quill makes or whatever enables them to adjust that oh now i know what i'm looking for on that palette of brushes in my digital mm -hmm. you know cintiq pad so are any, I was did, teaching them. have any of your students gone on to work in the industry that you're aware of yeah i think there's a few that have worked that are already working i can't remember their names offhand but uh man i've had some pretty amazing like i say inspirational to work with students uh, that are just 
coming out of nowhere you know that's awesome. it's crazy the the talent you see that's the best part about uh teaching at the academy of art is so many talented uh instructors i love all the you know the instructors up there are fantastic artists um working with them and the students is is so much inspire inspiration i hope it continues but i'm readying myself for moving on if if it is the case because the Academy of Arts getting to the point where um, if you don't have this amount of students in your class, the class isn't worth us putting on, you know, right, right. super expensive school. It is. Yeah. Um, and so my class in general, let's say averages about six students per semester. So mm -hmm. that ain't going to cut it for them. They're, they want classes with 20 in it and stuff like that. And I've, I think I've only, in my 10 years of teaching up there, I've only had one semester with, a, with 18 or 20 students in it. Most of the time it's eight to, eight to uh, 10 or eight, eight or 11. Do you, do you so, think that's an indication of like people's interest in comics and being in the industry? Or do you think it's just, what do you, what do you think that's attributed to? Yeah, it's kind of tough to say. I mean, uh, maybe they're moving in different directions or, or, you know, I mean, the my, I don't really, maybe my class not having a lot of people, which I always liked. I always liked, yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't like those classes with 20. That's, that's yeah. too large. I love yeah. teaching with six other, you know, students. But I think I just, I don't think I promoted it very well. Whenever, I always noticed whenever I promoted the class better with flyers and posters and stuff like that you know, just tack them up around the school, or whatever, I'd get more people sign up. But there's so many classes that you can sign up for. And then the, I had great, you know, my buddies that are um, teaching like graphic novel and things like that, they would always go, okay, you have to take Mick Gray's course, because I'm not going to teach that, that part of graphic, making graphic novels in this class, you got to take his class. So he would always push them over too, which was so great, you know, but, but I think, you know, like I say, I'm readying myself. If it doesn't, uh, if I don't have classes in uh, the fall, um, I'll start working on my own online teaching on my own. Oh, good for you. That'd be amazing. I love it. That would be amazing. We, well, you let us know and we'll promote the heck out of it. Thank we've you. Got That's what a you lot need. Of, we, well, we've got such a, a lot of aspiring, you know, artists and writers here, you know. Yeah, I, run into fans, a, right? yeah I run into a lot of people that go, hey, can I take you know your course up at the academy of art and i go well it's so expensive you know you i think they charge like three thousand dollars to take my course at the academy of art or something like that and it's like and you get a huge cut of that all right of it. oh it's so huge yeah they they we all know how great teachers are paid <laughs> they're the gotta, highest paid people around aren't they um we've got a couple questions so eric's asking if prometheus ever gets picked up an option for a movie, who would oh. Mick want to play as the main character? Oh my God, that would be, you know, I always, I always say when CG uh, really came in, it was like, now it's, now we can make Promethea, you know, because if you tried to make Promethea without computer aided graphics, it wouldn't be able to be made. Wouldn't work, yeah. God, who could play her, you know? I don't know. Somebody like, she's, maybe she's getting too old, but. She's not that old. Angelina Jolie could play her. I don't know. I've never thought about who would play Promethea. It's very interesting. As long as they had Weeping Gorilla in it. That's all I care about. I want to see <laughs> Weeping Gorilla in the movie. Um, and we've got um, Michael who is saying that he met you when you did our 10 year anniversary and he bought a copy of your Albi Mouse. That was uh, a fun day when we were there with, with, with Liam's, Liam Sharp. Yeah, that was our reopening. So that was another question that we had. So um, any plans to work with him anytime soon? I love him so much. He said, right? you know, that was the first time I'd ever met him. And uh, at our at our reopening, grand yeah, reopening. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I um, have stayed in touch with him through Facebook. He's one of the, he's such a great guy. He's a really mm -hmm. great guy. I never knew he was a singer until recently. Saying had a, had a heavy metal band at one point. Yeah. I heard right. some of it. He was good. He could. He's like. Uh, he was like doing Deep Purple. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you know? So speaking of music and comics intertwining, we are in the same band together. That's kind of how we met. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What kind of stuff were you doing? Punk. Oh man. He was the singer. Yeah. She was the drummer. Cool thrash band. This is cool. 
I love it, man. I've had, you know, I've had a, a garage jam band for about over 10 years. Of course, nice. now we're not doing it anymore. I'm hoping again we get together. But that is the one of the greatest releases in the world. It is. To be able to mm -hmm. yeah. Plug into a, you know, a Fender Twin Reverb and crank that up and do some Ramon songs, you know. Oh. <laughs> I've there always wanted to be in a, in a Ramones cover band, always. T yeah. You know, that's that's the fun stuff. I was, you know, that's when I, when I was 16, uh, 1976, 77, you know, that's what I discovered and all my friends thought I was a freak, you know, that I liked this, you know, wire and the Ramones and uh, the New York Dolls. And they were like, what the hell? Cause everybody was into classic rock, you know, everybody's listening to Aerosmith and Ted Nugent. And I, I was, that's what I was listening to. But then when that came along, you know, we went and saw the Sex Pistols at their last show at, at Winterland. And ah, nice. that was, we just That's became, it. you know, punk rock fans. And so, so as far as playing, I never learned any more chords than those four chords that I learned. You need to. So you what is more? You don't need any more than four chords. Well, so the minute quarantine's lifted and you need a drummer, you call me. We got to get together. We got to rock. We got a we got a studio at our at our house. So fun! We got to do it. That'd be that'd be mm -hmm. a gas, man. Um, I mean, there's another question. Let's see, I think I missed one. Hang on. Do you do commissions? If so, how much? Well, you don't have to talk about cost, but you can yeah. maybe put you know. Cost. How can people find cost your work? just goes along with how detailed something is. If it's something small and simple, you know, it's rather cheap. If you can go up to upwards of whatever, I think I've done commissions you know, for maybe the most I've done commissions for is a few hundred dollars, something like that. But most of the time I'd say a, a commission on, on average is about a hundred bucks. And I do them once in a while, get, get in touch with me through Facebook. Uh, let me know what you, what you're interested in. My big thing is, is what I do is I usually do homage to somebody like, give me one of your favorite guys. And I'll do, like I say, the, the kind of comes into the chameleon thing. I like to be able to try to capture the style of an artist and because uh, I'm not much of a penciler. So if I do an homage, at least I can got something to work around, you know? Mm -hmm. I know who's when, asking. He's a big Yeah, when you commission me, you're commissioning me as an inker, you know? You're not really commissioning me to do pencils. If you said, do something original in pencils, you know, about all you'd probably get would be Albie Mouse doing. Do you have some work that you're selling that you want oh, to show, yeah. show us? You want to, I, we almost forgot about that. So here we go. I'm going to share my screen here. Hold on. And folks over on the YouTube, you're going to have to watch this in the rewatch so you can see all the cool things that we're can seeing. Can you see my screen? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Hold yeah. Hold on. We don't need the music. Can you see that? Yes. Oh, awesome. Okay, so that one is, uh, let's go back to that. That's Ramona. Rodden. Oh, wait, so she drew this. How old was she? 93. Oh, good Lord. God love her. I just got the Art Amazing. of Ramona Frauden uh, hardcover. Such and... an honor to be able to work over a true original legend. legend. And just look at that. It's beautiful for that. For a 20 year old, that's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she's an this amazing, is, this, amazing. Now, what we're looking at here is all stuff that shows up in the um, the Liberty Brigade hardcover that comes out later this year. This is a guy wow. by the name of Gary Gastoni. I didn't know his work very much, but it's a beautiful piece. I love the action shot. Yeah, speed lines. I love speed lines. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Sorry. There we go. Now here's so, Brit. The rest wow. of this, is, yeah. The rest of this is Barry Kitson. So, yes, uh, it is. And this is, I just love. He's a he's one of the one of the most classic style guys you'll ever come across, and just just a really a treat to ink. So him. cool. And they, like I say, all these characters pretty much are all from old forties and fifties comics that are all available now to people to do whatever they want with them now. You know. Awesome. These two characters, I'm pretty sure, were 
developed by Michael Finn, the writer, as new characters coming into the, the fold with all these old, old characters. And they brought, they, the Liberty Brigade is kind of like the Justice League where they bring all these characters together. So cool. Look at that. Lots, now oh you're gonna God. see a, a whole bunch of double page spreads. These are all wait, very waited till the end of the project to do them all in a row. That's the uh, the aviators. We're, we're on Facebook too right now, if you want to see it, but we'll post it all live after the fact. Sorry guys on YouTube. <laughs> so these are just oh so God. fun. Awesome. Doing these giant fight scenes with 300 different characters. It's just such a blast. How long does it take you to do a paint like this? They, these, I was taking my time on these because we weren't rushed. So I yeah. was like, I was like working on them, you know, maybe three, four days a piece. But generally, when you do something and you're in a de deadline, you better do one page a day or a double page spread might, shouldn't take you any longer than two days, I would think. Oh. And there's, uh, there's oh. Chris's. Chris's colors. So this being, cool. you know, that classic stuff, he's going nice and bright, but he does a beautiful job with it. I love the way he's coloring this stuff. Mm -hmm. So rad. Neat. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot. It looks fun. like a lot of fun. So many, so many completely insane, crazy 40s characters, you know? Yeah, it's no. Nanan, yeah. There were dozens of publishers back then. Oh yeah, they were just all over the place, man. Awesome. So there you love, go. Love, love, love. Yeah, that's a ton of work. That That's exciting stuff. Thank and you for sharing it, it, that with us. It is really, really fun, like I say, to be connected back up with Barry. Barry's like so busy and he's so fast. He can work really, really fast. He's constantly doing commissions and stuff for people. That's a guy that does commissions, tons of them. But uh, now that I'm connected back up with him, I'm hoping that uh, we'll be working a little bit more together in the near future on other projects, you know, because he likes, he's a guy that is, the neatest thing about Barry Kitson is he's an amazing inker, an amazing mm -hmm. inker, mm -hmm. and he likes what I do. So, I mean, mm -hmm. if I can make him happy inking him, I, I got to be doing something right, you know? That's awesome. Yeah. Wonderful. Looked like a ton of fun. Wonderful. There's another new new compilation that just came out, the Superboy. Look at that. Celebration of 75 years of Super Superboy, and it goes all over the place from way, way back, you know, way back stuff. Uh, yeah. And then they end up with... Uh, um, they end up with it with our Superman stuff at the end. So we get a giant oh, nice. at the end of the book. Yeah. So that's, that's not out yet, right? That's your comp copy. Yeah, I don't think this is out yet. You, yeah. it's pre, you can pre-order, I'm pretty sure. But uh, okay. But what a beautiful package they put. Oh, look at the cover. I, I always love the way they put uh, different covers nice. on. Look at that. Really cool. Awesome. Yeah. But yeah, that's it. You know, that's what I love the most about DC is they're really good at keeping things in print, you know? I mean, this is gonna be important to me as I get older, you know? Mm -hmm. If they can keep product of mine, 30 years of product of mine in print, um, one way or another, we don't, you know, that's great for me. We don't know how it's gonna be in print. We don't know if it, you know, I mean, we kind of assume, you know, that this kind of stuff is, is always gonna be made, nice, nice books. I sure hope, I keep my fingers crossed that we always have nice quality, graphic novels and hardcover. Yeah, high production value stuff yeah. is really cool. All those stuff anniversary ones hands. have been like that. Not digital, stuff in no. our hands. Quality stuff. Where is it all going? We don't know. So much change is happening lately. Yeah, but we're uh, we're rolling with it, moving and shaking, doing what I'm we glad. gotta do. To you guys are positive coming. people, I love it. I love you. Them. Keep making them, and we'll keep selling That's them, right. as my man Joe Ferreira That's likes right. to say. <laughs> Joe, I love Joe. He's one of the best guys in the world, man. <laughs> yes, he is. Uh, Just, we'll I we... think I stopped into his shop a couple weeks before everything happened. I hadn't seen him for a while, and me and Holly were over looking at a house in Santa Cruz, and we said, "Let's stop in and say hi to Joe." And so we were over there talking with him for a little while. 
What a great guy. He's great. Yep. He's amazing. That's uh, He's our mentor. That He's who we called when we were thinking about opening up a retail shop. So we called him first and he helped us steer the, the waters. He actually he told is, us about Brian. We, we didn't know that the shop was for sale. He yeah. put us in touch. So he, we have him to thank for all of this. Yeah, he's, uh, he's, yeah. The, he's one of the perfect people to mentor retailers. Him and Joe Fields, those two guys. Yeah, yeah, we talk yep. to those guys a lot. You know, we've been here almost, this is our 18th year. We're doing our 18th uh, anniversary here in a few weeks. Wow. Uh, but I'm still learning. Uh, I'm, I'm still, uh, and compared to the two Joes, I still feel like the new guy. Uh, I, well, I'm, we are. I'm calling them up all the time being like, you know, I don't understand. I don't understand. And, and, do? you know, and they have, of course, you know, well, back in 85, this, when this happened and, uh, oh, this one time in 92 and all like that. So yeah, for the, you gotta the have, uh, we all need mentors. That's right. 100%. That's, uh, Atlantis Fantasy World in Santa Cruz, one of the greatest comic book stores in the history of comic book stores. And Flying yes. Colors in Concord. Um, and Flying Colors in Concord. Two of the first comic shops around, too, really. Uh, well, Mick, we should be wrapping it up. Uh, and we really, really thank, thank you, you so for joining much. us. Uh, thank you for being our so special to guest you. today. Um, thank you guys for having me here, man. This has been a total honor, and I've loved seeing your beautiful faces and talking with you and i'll do it anytime you want and if you want to see that. my beautiful face all the time you can come to facebook friend me and i do k mick radio pirate radio all the time you can tune in look at look at this mug as i'm as i'm bopping and stuff here playing music <laughs> awesome. awesome we'll do that and we'll encourage all our people to do and the jamming. same we're gonna need to jam we gotta get together and jam that'll be a blast totally it's like ramones covers yes all day long all day all night Improvised punk rock songs is good enough for me. Yes. That's it. That's it. Play those four Speaking chords. Speaking my language. Yes. <laughs> awesome. You guys, I love you. Love you too, Mick. Thank you so much. Mick. All the best to you, sir. Take care of yourself. And stay tough and everybody. stay safe. You, you too. too. See you later. Thanks for watching. Sure thing.